Happy third day. Welcome back to Story Strategy Live with Don and Nancy of Evident Inc. Hope you're having a good week. Don, how's it going? I am good. How are you? Good. I'm very proud of myself because today I didn't go and we're live. Like I have a really bad habit of doing. <laughs> but I love that. That's my favorite part. Well, it's I not don't... like this is the New Year's Eve show, you know, where the ball's gonna drop and everybody <laughs> needs the excitement. So welcome to the last night of 2020 with Don and Nancy. Well, that will be a big one. We should have a New Year's Eve show. <laughs> yeah, because no, we we're not going anywhere. I'll be drunk, so no. <laughs> yeah, that's what makes it. We do awesome planning when we're drunk. That's going to be, it's not real useful, but it's awesome. Well, and hey I don't know what, what happened with the music, but it, it triggered Penny. So now I have this huge dog <laughs> trying to climb in my lap. I'm like, stop moving, go away. I had to put, well, this will be no shock because I think every time we've done this, I've had to put him out, sometimes in the middle of the show. But um, the dog and I went to Petco today to get his heart guard medication. And he, it was a very exciting outing for some of us. Um, <laughs> selected his own um, treat out of one of the bins that I didn't notice as we walked by. So we got to pay and I was like, oh, I guess we're, we're taking this too. Um, he met like the, a little tiny version of him. My dog is a um, oh. English chocolate lab. And so he was so cute and he was tiny, very square little heads. And this man was coming out of the vet with a little tiny chocolate lab, English square headed little tiny guy. And I just melted and Charlie lost his mind. because he wanted to play. <laughs> but Anyway, I had to put him out because he, he was bouncing off the furniture, like literally ricocheting, like jumping up onto the couch, which he's not allowed on. And then bouncing over to the chair, which he's also not allowed on. And it was just insanity. So I could get a case of the zoomies. Julie, I could be drunk yes. by 30, but I am not actually today. So, and most no. days, let's just put that out there. But New Year's Eve, maybe. New Year's I Eve. Know, then you're not going to see midnight. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, anyway. Okay. So, um, so. <laughs> yes, and here we are. Here we are again. Well, so did you want? I think that was my my funny anecdote. I did. We were going to talk about um, romance mass. I can't even talk romance author mastermind was the the conference that I went to uh, this weekend. My family allowed me to go get a hotel room to do it because it was supposed to be in Houston, but it ended up being virtual. And I knew there was no way with the dog ricocheting off the furniture and my children doing the same thing, basically, that I'd be able to focus. So that was what I did all weekend. Um, yeah, you were in the hotel last week. We got to see the back of the hotel. That's remember? right. That's right. Yeah. So it, it was awesome. It was really, really helpful. Everybody I've talked to who, who did it has said it's, it was great. So... Yeah, it's it's less well, I mean it's a little crafty, but it's really focused on business, like how, you know, how do you do this thing that we're all trying to do on the indie side because when we were all traditional or, you know, at the time when authors were traditional, a lot of that stuff just wasn't stuff you had to think about. Marketing used to be something the publisher did, um, and you certainly didn't have to think about, you know, gosh, do I want to get international translations? Should I put this book in audio? <laughs> like that stuff just wasn't on your plate. So it's it's a whole new world, but it's very exciting. Well, good. I'm glad you had a good time because every everybody I've talked to three. You mm. make person number four who has been like, "Oh my gosh, did you do Ram? It was awesome." And I'm like, "No, I'm the loser. Who didn't go to the party, I guess." But, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was like a writer thing. I don't think there were a lot of editors there. I mean, God, the people that were there, like there were conversations, like one of the, one of the talks, <laughs> I was like, I guess I'll go to this was how to take your income from six figures to seven. <laughs> I was like, huh, <laughs> are we really there? <laughs> I was going to say, so you went to that, right? So you can share some tips later. We can well, there was also a how to, how to go from five to six, which is a little more in my realm. Um, and that was the one that Theodore Taylor did. I was that hers? I'm pretty sure that was hers. Yeah. And it was just freaking fantastic. But so yes, highly recommended. If you ever get to go, Kay Island says yes. Ram she knows is, what's awesome. up. Anyway, we should probably get moving on with it. We so should we get moving about? on. Yes. <laughs> we are talking about the midpoint today. We are talking about the point where everything changes. And that's this my is favorite. Sex at 60, right? Yes. Sex at 60, <laughs> which, 
which sounds like some kind of weird, like AARP pamphlet that you would get in the mail. <laughs> but, but that is not what we're talking about. So um, we're doing our back to basic series. We're almost done. We've got this that we're going to talk about the midpoint and a little bit about the, uh, the, pinch point, which we talked about last week. So we'll talk about the pinch point that comes after the point just briefly. And then we've got the lost night of the soul. Dark night of the soul. Dark all night of lost. the soul. All is lost. You want to talk about mixing yeah. some metaphors. And then it's you Christmas. Know, yep. <laughs> and then it's New Year's Eve and we're not going to be here New Year's Eve. So, so midpoint, this is where your character shifts. This is where everything, they go from being proactive or sorry reactive to proactive everything changes at the middle and that's exciting because that's a point that some of these other ones we've been kind of you know they're diagnostic and they're if you don't know exactly where your pinch point is that's okay it's something you go back and look at but the midpoint is like you need to know that at the midpoint this is where things are going to change Definitely. And I always know, like, that's, you guys all know I'm a discovery writer. I've decided to call myself that instead of a pantser, because um, I think it's more accurate, really. I do plot mm -hmm. some stuff. Um, but Joanna Penn says discovery writer, and I like that. Um, so I, I do always know, like, what is the midpoint shift? But I always think of it as the high point, um, because I write romance. So it's it's a very specific thing in romance versus what it what might be in a thriller or a mystery. Right. We're going to talk about those two differences of it's either a, a false victory or a false defeat. So, okay. Yeah. So I guess in romance, it's really kind of a false victory. Right. Cause that's when everything starts to, as I put it, that's when everything jumps in the handbasket and starts headed downhill. So, um, so this is the point, the midpoint is where everything changes. And we talked before about, the plot point where you cross that threshold and the door closes behind you that the character can't really go back. The midpoint is that door is locked, sealed. Somebody has come by with one of those like massive nail guns and shut it. There is no way to go back to where they were before. Yeah. What's well, just what changes then between the plot point where like the crossing the threshold, because we have said that's kind of the point of no return. Um, what changes between that and the midpoint shift where the door is literally locked? The threshold is, we say it's it's a point of no return. You can't go back because they've been drawn into the story and they can't, but the midpoint is they're more making a decision that they're not going back. Okay. They get that there's some kind of action has happened that actually makes returning to the old world completely impossible. Okay. To so where, it's like an external thing probably in the plot that has changed to match the or, internal decision yes. in the crossing the threshold. Like I'm going to yes. go do this thing. And then, Oh, by the way, you have no choice, but to do this thing. Right. Yes. Okay. And I think some of the examples we came up with are going to give some, uh, some support to that and really make that a little clearer. I did want to mention James Scott Bell has a book called write your novel from the middle. And like you were saying, you always know your midpoint, but which he writes. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he writes um, like thrillers, basically. Yeah. And so his whole thing is that you're basically you're making a V kind of of if you know that at the midpoint, this person is going to change from being this to being that, then you can write you start here and then you can be like, OK, so their life before was like this and then their life after is going to be like this. Yeah. That and he talks about having a mirror moment. Which um, we always in, in romance, we're like, oh, please don't describe yourself in the mirror. Please don't look in the mirror yeah, ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't stay away from all reflective surfaces. Um, but it's not about them describing themselves. It is more the character is looking at themselves in a what have I become type uh, manner. Like reflecting on, okay. And that's when you see them kind of making the decision of I'm moving from this to this. And I went through a lot of our, the romance movies that we talked about before, and they really don't have that mirror moment of them actually like looking in the mirror. Now, Pride and Prejudice does. And the, and the movie, the movie that Netflix just put out, there's a whole scene where she just walks into a room and just stares at a mirror 
for like 45 seconds and the whole world just moves around her for a little bit. Wow. Um, it's a literal interpretation. Yes. And so according to his theory, like you can find mirror moments. They don't always fall exactly in the middle, but you can find mirror moments throughout these things of at some point the, uh, person looks at themselves either literally like in a mirror or in a cell phone or in a pond, if it's, you know, they're out in the woods or whatever, they see themselves and make some kind of internal change. Um, I don't think we see that quite as much in romance because I think in romance, it's normally relationship based more than <laughs> internal decision based. I'm thinking, though, because of the Sex at 60 thing, which basically is built off of screenplays and the idea that a feature movie is two hours long. So at one hour in, you're at the midpoint. And that, if it's a love story and, and you've got your arc, um, is usually when your characters will consummate their relationship. So <clears throat> it may not be sex, but it will be, you know, the thing that cements the fact that, okay, we were both interested in each other. We have both decided to pursue this thing um, or at least our infatuation slash lust slash whatever has driven us to a point where something happens. And then immediately after that, usually there is a reflective moment um, either in one or both characters POV or sometimes rather than looking inward though, they're looking often at the other person. Like, mm -hmm. like I am accepting you. I am ready. I am at this point where, where I have decided that you yes are going to be the person. And then that's when everything starts to fall apart. Well, and a lot of times too, if, exactly what you said, if, especially in romance novels, you'll have that moment where after the first time they're together, one of them goes into the bathroom and, you know, to take a shower, to do whatever. And they look in the mirror and they see themselves. Yeah. Or they and, are laying in bed and thinking like, wow, okay, I have, I can't believe I'm a person that just did that. Like what kind of person right, am I? Yes. That sort of thing. Yes. And so let's talk about the sex at 60 for a minute, because that's really kind of fun. Um, because like you said, it is, yeah, of course it is. Well, I don't know. I'm not 60. So this is, <laughs> we're talking 60 yeah. minutes. 60 minutes is what we're focused on. Um, Dirty Dancing, which is a really good example of a romance. Um, they have, it's almost to the minute if they have sex at 60 minutes. There are a lot um, of movies where it's almost to the minute. Did you do your analysis thing again with the stopper? I did. So I did. did you find that to be true? I found that, it, um, so Dirty Dancing, it's like almost to the minute, hey, we're falling into bed now. Um, the Holiday, which is really, I want to say it's a cute movie. It's not a cute movie. Don't watch it with your kids in the room. But it's a really. I tried to watch that movie. I think I, did I end it? I think I did watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's where she like meets like an Aussie guy or something, right? And they like are only dating on the yeah. holidays. Yeah. They meet at a mall yeah. or something. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very popcorny movie. I mean, it's it's not like something that sticks with you, but it's a it's a good romance laid yeah. out because. And I'm gonna do a spoiler here. Um, the set the sixty percent mark or sorry the fifty percent mark is not sex. So it's what we're doing part, here. the part where he gets hurt, she takes him to the hospital because. For those of you who don't know the, the movie, because I know uh, right. Nancy and I just kind of talked in half sentences. Um, they meet and they make an agreement that they only date on holidays. So they are only going to be together on Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day. They are each other's holiday. There is no other strings attached. There's no romance. It's only this. And they're not, they're not having sex at that point. It's just we show up, we have a good time. He gets hurt at a 4th of July thing. She takes him to the hospital and the 60% mark is she's getting ready to leave because his arms all band, his hands all bandaged up and he's sitting like this. She's getting ready to leave and she pats his arm and it's like, okay, well, if you need anything and he puts his hand over hers. Oh, well, so I was thinking even her taking him to the hospital because she like doesn't immediately jump in the car to do that. Um, right. Is almost because of the way they set that up um, with sex kind of being off the table, um, that was like her committing to him and him needing her and then both realizing that, oh my God, maybe this is something more than just a holiday date. So it was almost like sex, it served the same purpose. Right, and it's a, it's that moment, the moment, because you see it on their faces, you see everything change the moment she he covers up her hand because then she's like, 
okay, well, I got to go. And she like pulls away and leaves and, you know, things get weird after that. Um, the other one that I was going to point out that it, that it also, uh, well, we'll talk about that one in a second. Um, Twilight doesn't have sex because it doesn't have sex until right. like, I don't know, whatever later movie. Three, maybe, I don't know. Um, but the, the midpoint of the first Twilight movie is the lion. So the lion fell in love with the lamb conversation where they are out in the woods and she's like, I know you're a vampire. I'm not scared of you. All that. And he's like, look how sparkly I am. Um, but the, the midpoint is almost exactly where he says, so the lion fell in love with the lamb and, uh, she says something like what a stupid little lion or what a stupid little lamb or something like that. Huh. So, um, so that was what I thought was interesting is in a lot of the romance novels and I was going to pull some of them, but then we get into the, not everybody's read them. That's, that's the midpoint is everything. That's the high point of the relationship. Like you said, we have made it. We've worked so hard. They're finally having sex. And then, sex always causes issues. And so like the neck, usually like the next scene is where everybody just starts climbing in the hand basket and the, all the little cracks start showing up and everything goes bad. Right. So uh, leading up to that in my, my little plotting situation that I use on Scrivener, it always says um, like fun and games are leading up to the sex at 60 and then more fun and games, but with like a dark edge. And if you take right. my, yes. my little plotting course, <clears throat> that kind of walks through how I plot a romance um, at Teachable, you'll see all of that. And, and I'm very descriptive. And um, one of my <laughs> plot points, I think, is like bad stuff happens. <laughs> and then the next one is like right. more bad stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> so the bad stuff helpful. gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although if you take the class, I actually do explain like how they differ and what's in there. Anyway. So we talked about the, that's a false victory. Because, right. I mean, if... Every, if they were going to live happily ever after at that moment of they've finally, you know, they've worked for this relationship, they finally have sex. And then the next morning, bad things don't happen. And then more bad things don't happen. And then they just get married. Then that would actually be like the victory. But because it's a false victory, that's, that means the bad things have to happen. But it doesn't mean that the victory should be any less sweet because that is a real right. moment. You have to serve yes. it up and make it extra gooey and awesome because they've been waiting for that. They could see it coming. They knew, you know, we're climbing, we're climbing, something's got to happen. So when you give it to them, don't phone it in. you got to make it good. Yes, that has to be like, that's the moment. Well, and you've got some more moments coming, but that's like the big, that's the biggest moment at that point. If that's your your false victory. And it can also be a false victory. It doesn't have to just be in romance. It can be a false victory in fantasy or in thrillers or in anything where they think they've achieved their goal. Well, so let's talk about that. Like, do you have an example? Like I'm trying to think Lord of the Rings or like Wizard oh. of Oz. What do we have? False victories. Like when they finally get to Oz and they walk into his chambers, is that a false victory? I would assume I didn't do, I didn't map out Wizard of Oz. So, um, but I would, assume that sounds like the false victory. Um, in Runaway Bride, if you remember that movie. Is that the Julia Roberts movie? Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. Mm -hmm. And she's been engaged, but she's never been married. And he's a newspaper reporter there to cover right. the story of how she's going to run from this wedding. Um, the midpoint in that is, her trying on her wedding dress and she gets the wedding dress that she's always wanted. And it's, it's kind of a mirror moment because there's mirrors all around yeah. her. And I was like, Oh, look in the mirror, look in the mirror, look in, she never looks in the mirror. She looks at him and it's, there's a great line because she's like, how do I look? And he looks at her for a second and he's like, you look fine. And she's like, you're reading your magazine upside down. That's better than fine. <laughs> And so they, you know, they have this moment there, but it's a false victory because she thinks she's going to get married. She has the wedding dress of her dreams on. And so, which she does get married, but just not to the person you think so. Think so. And then, um, so those, it's that moment that everything's good. It's all good. I'm going to get whatever goal. And it can be in, uh, 
like in a thriller, it can be the point. Well, in a thriller or um, mystery, it's usually that's it's usually a false defeat. It's when things get really bad. But it Wait. can be the moment where they think something. They think they've caught the guy. Yeah, that's what I would assume it would be in a like in a mystery, especially. But you're saying it could instead be like instead of up here, it's down here, down there. Yeah. But then things start getting better. Like that seems sort of unfulfilling then when they make well, the big recovery at the end. That's the difference between the romance and like the thriller genre is because if it's a false defeat, meaning that they think they've caught this guy and then bam, there's another person dead. It's that's when the shift happens in the character rather than in the plot. Okay. And that is the character being like, no, this time I'm going to catch him. I'm, I've got myself together, I'm going to catch him and things get better for a little bit. Like usually that's where they're like gathering a team that they're going to go after this person and they're getting all the good clues and that kind of thing until yeah. you get to that punch in the gut pinch point, which is usually when somebody directly related to the protagonist gets hurt. Okay, that makes sense. So yeah, and then there's gathering all their forces again because they've got this final push. So Storm but I did- castle. Storming the castle. Sorry, I love that. <laughs> that comes towards the end. <laughs> Have fun storming the castle um, <laughs> for my Princess Bride friends. So, but you can have a false defeat in a romance too, because we talked about the wedding planner last time. Right. And in the wedding planner, you have Jennifer Lopez as a wedding planner. Matthew McConaughey is a guy that saves her from almost getting hit by a dumpster they have like a moment and then she finds out he's engaged to one of her clients. And the midpoint is him confessing to her that he has all these feelings for her, which you would think would be like a victory because she's getting the guy, except for her answer to him is you're engaged and I respect the woman you're engaged to. She is somebody that I could be friends with. And so this will never happen. And so then it becomes a false defeat because of course, by the end of the movie, they're together. Right. But so it can show up in romance that way too. And then um, a way that it's kind of more plot related in romance than character related is 50 first dates with Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. I remember um, the movie. I don't remember like I just remember the, all the dates. I don't remember how it ends <laughs> or the plot. Is there the a plot? whole thing on? Yes, there is a plot. <laughs> and the whole thing on that is she was in an accident, and so she cannot create new memories. Right. And so she thinks every day is the day that it was her father's birthday, the day that she had the accident. And so every day she does the same thing. Well, she meets him. And things are a little bit different and he's doing, and so he figures out like, she doesn't really remember me, but he doesn't really know why yet. Like somebody has told him things, but he doesn't know like the specifics of the whole situation. Right. And then the midpoint is her father and brother. It, it kind of crisscrosses her father and brother pull him aside and are like, look, she will not remember you tomorrow. You know, this, this is the world we're living in. This is the world we're stuck in. And then like immediately after that, they have, she has what they call a bad day. Mm -hmm. it, it's a day that she figures out. She doesn't, she doesn't know what's going on, that she's lost a whole year of time, all of this kind of stuff. And so you get to kind of see both parts of it. And it feels like a really false, it feels like a, a defeat because he's realizing I can't really, whoops, I can't really have a relationship with her. Cause she didn't remember me from day to day. Every time she goes to sleep, she starts over basically. Yeah. And then you can see how devastating it, it is for her to be living in this world because like they take her to this doctor and um, the doctor explains to her what has happened. And she's something is said and they're like, she's like, no, but I want to ask. And they're like, you have every time we've been here X amount of times. And so it really kind of lays out for her how bad things are at that point. So yeah. that would be a false defeat because then things get better. I have a total tangent and I'm really sorry, but I'm not that sorry. Oh, what you just said about people not remembering. Well, so she doesn't remember him every day. 
Mm -hmm. um, I just read the most fantastic book that I highly recommend called The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Have you read it? I have not read it. Everybody in the world has told me I need to. It is on my list for Christmas vacation. I'm totally yeah, going to read it so while good. we're on break. So there is, well, I don't want to ruin anything for anyone, but there's a very similar parallel in there that's just, it's done so well. But it never occurred to me that like, I wonder if she got this from 50 first dates. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure she didn't, but it's, there's this. Uh, yeah. There. But yeah, I will, I will check that out. Put um, it on your okay. list, people. So, so those were the examples. Oh, one other example, I, two other examples I really wanted to point out that kind of give the whole, the whole shutting the door, you can't go back that, that way. Um, there's a great movie on Amazon Prime called Britney Runs a Marathon. And it's, I know, don't make that face. It's a good, <laughs> don't make that face. Come on, title people. <laughs> But it's a um, it's based on a true story of this woman who she's kind of pudgy and she's into drinking a lot and not taking care of herself and all that kind of stuff. And she ends up deciding she's going to run. Um, I think it's the New York City Marathon. And uh, did you say it's not hard? I said that sounds hard. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm like considering I can't run to my mail my mailbox. But um, so she's going through all of these transformations. And of course, they're they're external transformations and with her body, the way she looks, that kind of thing. But she's also going through a lot of internal. And she has a roommate that she lives with, but she also is house sitting. That's what she's doing as a job, is she's house sitting. And um there's this great moment at the midpoint that her roommate's always her, her roommate's thinner than her and kind of prettier, a little bit more together than her. And so her roommate's always kind of passive aggressively mean to her and isn't supportive of any of the lifestyle changes she's made. And it's like, you are not, you totally aren't a runner. I don't know what you think you're doing, that kind of thing. And um, the roommate comes home and her and the roommate have an argument kind of, and, um, Basically, she realizes this isn't the life she wants. That the roommate doesn't support her. Nobody in this kind of circle supports her. This isn't who she wants to be anymore. She doesn't want to be involved in everything that's going on. And they get in a fight, and she literally shuts the door to the um, to the bathroom. She shuts the door, and then the next scene is her moving into the house she's house sitting in. Nice. And yeah. so it's it's a great like I was like oh my gosh perfect midpoint. So, because, you know, I'm dorky like that, but that's no, okay. That's a good example, but so is, you put it on here, um, Monsters, Inc., which I love, <laughs> because there's a point at which, like, you know, the monsters have to stay secret or whatever, but they reveal themselves to Boo, I guess, um, and take the risk of taking her with them because they know she's in danger. Um, yes. And I don't remember the details of the plot, but I know, like, once they have committed to keeping her and not, you know, sending her back and putting her back in her bed and everything. I don't know why I'm going like this. Um, <laughs> that's, that's putting her in her bed. <laughs> then um, that is when like they, there is no going back from that. Yes. And that's a perfect, and I know it just because I was reviewing it today. Like I, we have Disney plus, so I was totally, um, I should have that movie absolutely memorized because that was my son's comfort movie when he was little. Oh, and, Anytime he was sick, you knew he was really sick when all he wanted to do was curl up on the couch with his car's blanket and watch Monsters, Inc. That's <laughs> what he wanted to happen. And so the, the moment that you're talking about is they actually have doors because the doors go into the kid's room for them to scare them. Right. They actually have doors. And Randall, the bad monster, has told Mike Wazowski the kid's door will be on the floor at this time. You've just got to put her back in her room. And Sully is like, yeah, I'm not okay with this. And so they start to put her back in her room and then they're like, nope, not going to do it. And they hold her back. And that's when Randall comes out of the door and, you know, he was there to kidnap her. Yeah. And again, the door closes and they're like, nope, we can't. And so, yes, that's a. Yeah, there's a lot of I, doors in that movie. I forgot about that whole scene where they go through the shredder and stuff too. And they have to put it back together. Yes. Yes. Um, and one, another one that I thought was a really good example of everything changes is um, in Narnia, um, the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, the first Narnia, mm -hmm. 
there's the midpoint scene is they've gone through all of this stuff. They, they got to Narnia. They figured out that um, the white queen has been doing some really bad stuff. They've, and they go through all of these challenges and the, the 50% mark is where father Christmas shows up and gives them their weapons. And he's he's handing out like he gives a, a bow to the older girl and he oh, gives the little girl right. a dagger and he gives him a sword. Oh, and, yeah. And so he hands out all the weapons and he says something like it's I, um, I meant to write down what he says. He says something like Narnia is changing. Winter is leaving something like that. And then they start talking about the fact that the ice is going to not the ice is going to melt now. And so I thought that was a great example of the whole world shifting everything yeah. and, and your characters going from being reactive up until that point, they've just been reacting to what's been happening to them. They've just been in survival mode. They've just been trying to make it past every obstacle to now they have been equipped because they've got weapons and they actively make the decision of the next step that they're going to take. So they become proactive. after Right. That. I bet there's a really good example in the Lord of the Rings Chronicles too, but I have watched it such a long time ago and read it much, much longer ago. So I can't pinpoint yeah, what that I, moment is. But I remember them kind of being on this merry little journey, just sort of going along with it. And then all of a sudden at some point they know what the mission is and they're dedicated to making the mission no matter what happens to them. And yes. I think some of that in like high fantasy like that is a realization of the stakes. Like yes. it's easy for a character to be in their own world and see their own point of view. But sometimes I think that midpoint shift is coming to face to face maybe with the actual antagonist or understanding what the stakes are and realizing this is bigger than me. So like, I will do this thing. Yes. I think that's a great way to put it. The only, I I've never been, I hate saying this too loud because my family can hear me. I've never been a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Like not to the point I would have them memorized. Oh. Um, and I know the only thing I remember about it was we went and saw one of the movies when I was hugely like Shamu sized pregnant with my daughter. And every time the race would scream, the black creatures that make these horrible screeching oh, noises. Yeah she would kick as if she was learning how to river dance. She did not <laughs> like that noise at all. The orcs. Yeah. 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 So, but Viggo Mortensen, I mean. Well, I mean, I, I, I didn't say I minded <laughs> watching him. I'm just saying I don't have them memorized. Yeah. No, I, I think I've only seen them once or twice. Um, and I think we might've watched them with the kids finally, but we were really hesitant. I was really hesitant because those orcs are so scary looking. Um, mm -hmm. But my husband was like, oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's always the husband that does that, right? That's like, oh my, ah, God, my kids things that, and I have a kid who, do you remember that whole Charlie bit me thing a long time mm -hmm. ago? Silly little meme. He watched that and there was like a, a fake version of it where they were zombies instead of just the little kids. And when Charlie bit him, like his finger came off or something. And that scarred my kid for a month to the point where you could not even say Charlie. You would freak <laughs> out. It was before we had the dog. But now I was going to say, but now we have the dog. <laughs> okay, I have not looked at the at, at the chat at all. Do we have any questions? Well, so um, Ki and I were chatting about Twilight a little bit. I mean, not in depth, and then Kay agreed with me about Vigo, which I, I mean, you have to really. Yes, yes. I mean, that's just not a question. No, but there there were no actual questions. Okay. We must have been extremely clear today. Does anyone have any questions? We are happy to make up an answer. <laughs> All right. Well, so our next episode is December 17th. Is it already the 17th next week? Oh, my God. Yes. Holy now, God. tomorrow's the 11th. Where is this month? Um, at least it's the end of 2020, so... I guess yeah. that's good. You you want to ask me how much Christmas shopping I have done? Maybe as much as me. Like I have a lot left. <laughs> Thank God for Amazon's one day delivery. <laughs> right? yeah. I see paying for shipping in my future. I'm just saying. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So Dark Night of the Soul coming just before Christmas as 
it should. <laughs> As it should. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then no no shows for two weeks while we take a break and recombobulate. And then do we know what we're doing first thing in January? I don't think we do. We have ideas. We have ideas. We've brainstormed, but we haven't had our businessy talk yet. So we don't know for sure. What That's what we're Don starting and I with. call it when we talk about like <laughs> <laughs> businessy things. <laughs> We're very, very professional. Oh, yeah. So, but that's where we're at. We are almost in. We have the newsletter. The newsletter will be coming out in January. So, if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, sign up for the newsletter. It will be really useful. Maybe. It will be. Absolutely. (laughs) We are fountains of information. The problem that I'm having is. And I I don't know, Kay, did you go to RAM this year? Or obviously you've been because she said RAM is awesome. When you leave there, you, A, your head is just stuffed with like, oh, I have to do all these things. And then you also have like a giant to-do list that you've made for yourself over the course of all these smart people telling you all the things you should be doing that that, that you're too lazy to do or you just haven't bothered with. And so like that's what's in my brain right now is the giant list of things. Um, And so anytime I think about another thing I have to do, I'm like, oh. But I'll it'll settle. But that's a problem for future Nancy. Present Nancy just has to make it till next week where we're gonna talk about the dark night of the soul. That's all we gotta do. One week at a time for all present and future Nancy's and Dawn's. Okay, Kay, I was there all three years in a row. I was there too, but um I missed the first one. It wasn't special enough to be invited the first time. Technically I was there last year, but only for dinner. You were there. I would have, I was there, but if it would have been in Houston this year, I totally would have come down and had dinner with everybody again. I know. So, well, hopefully yeah. next year. Although, like I said, I was telling Don earlier, I almost felt like the online format, I missed seeing people, I missed hanging out, but boy, I was much more able to like focus on what I was supposed to be learning. I could pause it, write notes, look things up if I wanted to. Um, so in a way it was better, but I'll, I'd rather see people, I think, in person. I would, I vote for people. (laughs) That's just me. I vote for people. So, okay. All right. Well, hopefully um, we will see you for the dark night of the soul next week. Yes. Thank y'all for hanging out with us. All right. Have a good week guys.